quite a few things that are recognizable in different heroes. For example, they are people who are very brave and courageous, or they are leaders, or they're particularly talented. And honestly, all these things are quite hard to relate to, aren't they? Sure, it's easy to be inspired by heroes, but what I'd like to talk about is how about we give them a hand? And I don't mean applause or recognition. I mean, how about we try to help out the heroes? Because if you think for a moment about your favorite fictional hero, for me, it's Han Solo, but where would he be without Chewie? Frodo without Sam? Sherlock without Dr. Watson? In the background, all of these heroes had super sidekicks. And there are very few, if any, heroes that could make it on their own. And as a scientist, I kind of feel more in this role, that behind the scenes, we're doing work for this reason. So I was thinking about sidekicks and what they actually do, and I found four things that I think you can apply to any situation. In the first instance, they find a worthy cause. Secondly, you have to give hope to the heroes, because every hero is destined to reach a point where they lose hope. Third, the sidekicks have to take pride in their achievements, but not so much look for the recognition. And finally, they have to tell the heroes that we have to keep going, because the journey may not be over yet. If we get back to thinking for a minute, though, about heroes and true heroes, what I think of if true heroes might be something that's more familiar to us and that we can more relate to. These could be people that are more um, in touch with us in our everyday lives. For example, these could be paramedics, these could be doctors, firemen, or soldiers. These people are true heroes because their actions directly or indirectly affect our lives and they tend to be very brave actions. On top of that, all of these people are under enormous stress. And they can, like a fictional superhero, come up against life or death situations. However, real people are not invincible. <clears throat> I met Captain Mark Evans in 2014. He was a soldier in Afghanistan, and his problems became evident when he came back to England. He found he had hyper anxiety, he started drinking, and he had flashbacks. These are intrusive and emotional memories that can trigger panic attacks. Now, all these things are typical symptoms of a psychiatric disorder called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. But it was a very difficult while before Mark was diagnosed. And PTSD originally was called shell shock after the First World War when it was described in a lot of soldiers who came back from the conditions in the trenches. But it's not just soldiers that can get PTSD. It's anyone who can be experiencing a traumatic event. And the estimates of how often this occurs vary for country to country because the methods of diagnosing them are quite different and sampling methods as well. But it could be up to 3% of the general population in the UK and up to 8% in the US. So I met Mark because I was giving a scientific talk about how the brain stores memories of fear and he was talking about his experiences and what sort of therapies he was able to find. In fact, for Mark, drama was actually a very useful therapy. Importantly, there are no drugs that are specific for PTSD. It's still a disorder we don't have a particular treatment for. So I think this is a worthy cause for neuroscience research into understanding what might underlie this disorder and will also tell us about memories. Because we all know what memories mean to us, right? If you think about your earliest memory as a child, for example, your first home, you can have the familiar smells or the sights come back to you, or your first day of school. But if I asked you what actually is a memory, it's a bit harder to envision. And historically, psychologists or neuroscientists use metaphors to explain memory phenomena. So in the early days, they compared it to a house. So you could explore the different rooms, which would be like your different memories, the corner of your minds sort of idea. And next up, they had made the observations that lots of memories for similar sorts of things could be stored together. So memories could be categorized like in a library. Different areas of the brain process different types of memory, so this made sense. With advancements in technology, I'm sure all of you have heard the brain being compared to a computer. So memory, as well, started to be compared to an information processing tool. 
something that was able to take in information from our environment, encode it, and store the file on our hard drive for later use. This is useful, but as well, like I said, the brain contains lots of regions that are able to function at the same time doing their own computing. So it might be more appropriate to compare memory to a network of computers working in synchrony together. This is an illustration of what the internet might look like, and this might be a good way to think about how memory is working. Because when we experience something new, the areas of the brain that are co-activated together can increase their connections to each other. And in this way, they become like a network of associative connections. These metaphors were all useful because they suggest um, a physical space for memory. And we know this is now the case, because if we look right down at the microscopic level into the cells which make up our brain, neurons, we can see how they connect to each other. They connect at specialized junctions called synapses, and the strength of connection between synapses can vary. This is called synaptic plasticity. They can be strengthened or weakened. And it's believed that after learning, the connections between this area, the associative trace which is formed, is so strong that in the future, a weak activation of part of it can retrieve the whole memory for us. So this is one way of showing how, like a web page, part of the memory can hyperlink to many other areas in the brain and reactivate the experience. I said that there were different types of memory, and in our lab, we're interested in memories that are emotionally potent. So we study an area of the brain called the amygdala. So we can understand why memories are important to us at a personal level, but in the sense of evolution, memory is believed to be there so that we can behave appropriately to our environment. We learn something about our past, and this information can be useful for the future. So in PTSD, on the other hand, what we think is happening is that this learning circuitry has gone out of whack and it's overactive. These fearful memories are triggered unnecessarily and they generalize so they're no longer appropriate for the situation. The amygdala has a special role in this because it processes the emergence of something new in the environment which is relevant to us to where we came in contact with it. So for example, a threat or food. And we study this in the lab using animal models and we've learned since the days of Pavlov and his dogs that if you play a neutral sound, like a bell, it can become associated with the reception of food, which is a reward in the environment. Likewise, a sound can be coupled to an unpleasant event. And just imagine for a second that before this talk, I had grabbed the person sitting on your left and said to them, when I show the picture of the amygdala, I want you to pinch them in their arm. I can bet that the next time the image comes back, you might feel your fight or flight response kicking in. And this is because the amygdala connects to those areas and it receives all the inputs from your sensory system as well. But importantly, you know that's not going to happen now. And if I left the image up for ages and you were looking at it again and again, you'd learn it's actually safe. It doesn't mean anything dangerous. This is similar to what is actually done with PTSD patients. They go through cognitive behavioral therapy, a special type called exposure therapy, where they're asked to remember the traumatic event in a safe environment, and they repeat this over a period of time, and they make a new learning. This new memory is thought to be competing with the old memory for the expression of behavior. So it's very useful treatment for a lot of people, but the problem is that it doesn't always work. If it comes a long time after the traumatic event, it's less effective. And also, if the people come in contact with a big stressor in their lives, the fear can return. So it's not perfect. But what I'd like to tell you about is that there's been an achievement at the level of, of basic animal neuroscience research which can propose a new therapeutic possibility for this disorder. I mentioned memories are living elements that can be reactivated and stored again. Once they're actually stored, they're not permanently fixed in our brains. The integrity of a memory changes over time. And interestingly, from recent years, we know that a reactivated memory temporarily becomes destabilized. So the reason the memory does this is so that it can integrate new information or remove old ones. Because you can imagine, if it was a web page, you'll need to update it every now and again with new information. So just like that, the memory trace 
can be reactivated and destabilized. But importantly, around the year 2000, an old discovery was re-explored, and some labs were able to find out the molecular requirements for these different stages in a memory's life cycle. And very interestingly, we discovered, others discovered as well, what is required for the memory to re-stabilize and continue to be stored in the brain. So you can imagine what the obvious experiment was. What happens if you block the molecular targets which allow a memory to re-stabilize? Effectively, what you will see is that the memory will become weakened. Effectively, in the, in the animal work, the rodents no longer have fear for the tone they were presented to, and it effectively erases a memory. Presently, though, there are a few drugs that could safely do this in humans, but it's very useful to know how this works because we'll get closer to developing new therapeutic targets where we'll be able to do this with patients. And even if it's early stages, what the research does do for the moment is it can give hope to PTSD sufferers. And many questions remain unanswered still. So I'd like to come back to thinking about that this sort of work often goes on in the background, and people may not be aware of it, but this theme of true heroes got me thinking that we can act as sidekicks, any one of us, if you identify a worthy cause, which in this case is doing basic brain research, which may someday be useful for a disease, if not in the near future. And then next, you need to be able to give hope. And importantly, there were a few labs, of course, that led this research in the early days, but now it's many labs across the world are contributing to it. So you can be proud of the achievements and not just looking for recognition. And finally, of course, the journey is not over, and we have to keep going, because there's many questions that remain unanswered. And I want you to consider that if, like me, you don't quite feel like hero material just yet, you can still be a super sidekick if you find your worthy cause. Thank you.